Well, let's take our Bibles right now this morning and listen to what God would have to say to us from Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll read these verses that we've been reading every week one more time as we'll be completing this series today. Look with me as I start reading at verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. These verses are written for a special time, not just every day of our lives, but it says specifically, the evil day. The evil day. What is an evil day? We all know what a good day is. I think we all know what an evil day is, too, though, right? Uh, The word evil there is a very broad term. It means anything bringing annoyance and trouble and pressure, which is on the low end of things, but then all the way up to harassment, danger, and disaster. Evil is very broad. Just when things go wrong in those days, this is when we need to read this passage and heed what it teaches. For Job, it was the great disaster of his losing all of his children in one day when the house they were in collapsed because of Satan's power. Same day, he lost all of his wealth. Same day, he lost all of his livestock, thousands and thousands of livestock, all died in one day. And not much later after that, he lost his health to the point where he's just right on the edge of death. That was a disastrous day. That was an evil, dark day for Job. But it doesn't have to be a great disaster like that to qualify as an evil day. It was an evil day when the serpent came and started a discussion with Eve, wasn't it? That was an evil day. It was an evil day when Judas was tempted by Satan to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Those were two of probably the darkest, most evil days of human history, and yet they weren't great, huge disasters. They were heavy pressure to give in to temptation. But they are just as evil. Uh, We today, when we face common temptations that every Christian has, doubts about our salvation, gossiping, worrying, laziness, overspending, lusting, lying, all the different sins that are up here, when those pressures are on you, that's an evil day. That's nothing to take lightly. And God is saying, when those evil days come, you have two choices. You can either give in to the pressure, or you can fight. And our passage is saying, fight. But you've got to fight in God's strength, because we are no match for demons. The older, wiser, stronger than we are, much more experience in how to fight, we cannot do it on our own. So God says, you take up my strength and fight back against the demonic forces that are coming against you, and you will defeat them. You will defeat them. And that's what we've been looking at. We've been looking at God's strength that defeats demons. And we've been seeing that there are seven of them. And because this is the last week that we are going to do this for a while, I'd just like you to grade yourself on how you're doing. We've gone each, uh, over each one of these. Uh, how would you grade yourself? First of all, using Bible truth. Are you using Bible truth when Satan comes at you with a desire to, you know, lie to someone because you want to get ahead or complain because things aren't going your way or to worry because the headlines are so bad? Are you shooting back with Bible truth saying, look, God says all things work together for good. I do not have to worry about my salvation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And shooting back with Bible truth. How would you grade yourself on that? Aim aim at getting an A here. You need to. The second one we looked at was blameless obedience. And none of us can live blamelessly, but all of us can aim blamelessly. Remember, our blameless obedience is the wall of protection around our lives where when we are seeking and aiming to be blameless in our speech, in our actions, in our thoughts, when we aim high like that, then we protect our lives. Of course we're going to fall, but we get right back up and keep aiming at blameless obedience. How do you grade on that? Do you need to up your aim in certain areas of your life. That will protect you from demonic attacks. The third is certainty of salvation. 
demons will come at you to doubt that God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God didn't save you. What are you going to do with that? You fire back with the truth of God's word. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. Get away from me. How do you grade on that? Then there's fierce trust. Demons will come at us to doubt everything. God isn't here for you. He's not listening to your prayers. This thing you're going through has no purpose. It's just going to end terribly. We, we say, no, I have fierce trust in God's promises. I'm holding up the shield of faith, and I'm going to tear down all those things that you're launching at me. How do you do on fierce trust? Then there's certainty of victory. And that is, the terrible time I'm going through right now is going to end in a good place. That's what God promises for all those who love him. But demons will come at you to get you to doubt that, turn away from it, not believe it, become depressed, become hopeless, give up. How are you doing on firing back with, no, I have the certainty of victory because of Jesus Christ. And the last week we looked at speaking God's words. He sent you home with homework to be able to list your top three sins and then secondly to find three verses that you can speak back when those things happen. Did you do the homework? Did you do that? If you didn't do it, do it today. It's not just a nice exercise to, you know, help you live a better life. Battling demons determines your quality of life. It determines everything. If you want a good quality of life in this world, you've got to be exercising these things. You've got to be firing back. If you want a good quality of life in the kingdom of God, God says, it depends depends on whether or not you're battling hard against demons rather than getting into them in this world. God gives us this passage so that we will fight hard. Keep fighting hard. If you need to up your fighting, up your fighting. God loves us and he wants us to be able to defeat demons and he's showing us how to do it in this passage here. So keep fighting hard. Today we're going to come to the last form of God's power that is mentioned in this passage. It is in verse 18. So look with me at Ephesians 6.18, the last form of God's power. Verse 18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. What's the last form of God's power that defeats demons? Prayer. Prayer. There's a passage in Luke uh, that says that the 70 disciples, the 70 returned with joy, saying to Jesus, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Jesus had given his power to the disciples as they went about, 70 of them, 70 of his close followers, sent them out preaching, and they had the power to be able to bring demons and cast them out of people. And he says, I saw it. I saw you doing it and in, in, the, in the spiritual realm. I saw it taking place. But then in another passage of Scripture, it says that Jesus came up to his disciples one day, and a man was there, and he was arguing with the disciples. And it says in Mark nine seventeen, Teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. But Jesus had given him his power? Yes, Jesus had given him the power to cast out demons. So why weren't they able to? Verse 25, Jesus says, Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him, And do not enter him again. And after crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And when Jesus came into the house, the disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. What did the disciples forget to do in the case of this demon? They forgot to pray. Jesus had given him them the power to do this, including the ability to pray about this, but they forgot to pray. As a result, they could not defeat this demon. They needed to go into battle prayer against this demon to be able to defeat it. 
what is the seventh strength that God gives us to be able to defeat demons? We can call it battle praying. Battle praying. They had the ability to defeat this demon. They just were not taking it up. And we must make sure that we are not guilty of that. When demons come at us, God says, they're going to be coming at you. But don't be like these disciples who forgot about praying. It takes battle prayer many times to be able to withstand a demon attack. When evil days, whether they be great disasters like Job experienced come upon us, or heavy temptation to sin like we do from time to time, we must fight back with battle praying. Now the question is, do you know how to do that? Do you know how to battle pray? Is it just the same as any other prayer? No, it's not. This passage gives specific ways that we are to pray in the evil day. The, verses, the verse we're going to look at isn't just for everyday Christian living. It's for when you are in the evil day, here's how to battle pray against demons. We need to learn this and we need to practice it in order to stand up against demons. So this passage gives us three instructions for battle praying. We need to note these. We need to practice them. Don't just go forth from here and say, yeah, it was a pretty good sermon, and then forget about this. You and I need this every single time we enter an evil day, which will be often in our lives. So let's look at the three kinds of instructions God gives us for battle praying, and it's here in this verse. First of all, with all prayer and petition, it starts off. Pray at all times in the Spirit. The first instruction for battle praying is this, and your insert, pray all kinds of prayers, not just one. Pray all kinds of prayers, not just one. When a soldier goes into battle, he usually has multiple weapons with him. He might have a rifle, he might have a pistol, he might have a knife, he might have grenades. And those are all there for him to use, not just one of them. In the same way, God gives us prayer to be able to use against demons, but there are many types of prayer. And God says, in order to battle demons, you don't go in and just use one type of prayer. You need to use all kinds, it says here. Now, what is the most common type of prayer that we tend to lean to when we have a bad day or a day of destruction going on? Requests. That's the first type of praying and talks specifically about petitions here. But that's making requests, asking God to do things for us. Uh, my daughter Emma Denae this week on Thursday when it was raining walked into her bedroom at the end of the day and found multiple drips coming down from her bedroom ceiling into her room. Hadn't even been up in the attic yet, but uh, there had been a, a leak in their roof, and it was now dripping down in, in large amounts into their rooms. Uh, what's the first thing she did? She called us to pray, because she didn't, wasn't quite sure how to start addressing this, who to call, what to do, but she, she turned immediately to praying, which is exactly what God tells us to do. The reason we have our church prayer chain is for the evil days as they come upon different ones of us, and we need help. So we set out the prayer chain to be able to pray for one another. That's exactly what God wants us to do in the evil day, make requests. But this passage is saying make more than just requests. There are all forms of prayer that we need to use in the evil day. Uh, We've gone over this before, and uh, remember Acts. Uh, Not the book of Acts, but that uh, word stands for uh, the four types of major types of praying that we can pray. Uh, Anyone remember what A is? Adoration. Um, Job, in the terrible day where he lost all of his children, lost all of his wealth, uh, and would soon lose almost all of his health, you know what he did? Job 1.21, he says, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's adoration. At the lowest point in this man's life, He didn't make a request when he lifted his head to pray to God. He praised God. That's battle praying. Job got it. The second one, C, is, you remember, confession. Yeah, uh, if there's anything going on in your life that God is not pleased with, (laughs) in the day of battle, you've got to confess that and turn from it. Because you won't have his protection uh, in the same way that you will when you are wholly seeking him. Half-hearted seeking God does not give you the same protection as blameless obedience. And then T, anyone remember? Thanksgiving. 
Uh, this is in your dark time, in the pressure that you're going through. You're thanking God that he has all things working together for good. You're thanking God for the good things that are going on in your life. You know, people who might be supporting you, people praying for you, things that God has allowed to go well in your life in spite of all the difficulty that's going on. Thanking God. Uh, you know, thanking and praising God are just as much needed as making requests of God in the evil day. And then the last one is supplication, where God we request God to supply. That's where that comes from. Supply our needs, and that's the one that we tend to naturally turn to in the evil day, uh, requesting God for the supply of our needs. All these are needed. God is telling us. So, what grade would you give yourself in this? This is battle praying, and the first one, the first instruction he gives us is pray all kinds of prayer, not just one. How would you grade yourself in this? First of all, are you remembering to pray at all? Because a lot of times we'll get involved in a leaky roof or terrible uh, time going on of pressure to you know, cheat or to lie or to lust, and we forget to pray at all. We just kind of run around trying to do what makes sense to us. Are you remembering, first of all, to battle pray? Secondly, are you remembering to battle pray with all forms, giving adoration to God, giving confession of any sins, giving thanksgiving for what's going right, as well as making requests. This was an eye-opener for me this week, uh, as I was praying about some things that were going on. I wasn't just making requests now. I realized, no, I need to give all these types of prayers. God says, in that evil day, don't just give one type. Give all kinds of prayers. Make sure you're doing that, too, when uh, it's an evil day. So God's first instruction is pray all kinds. Of prayers, God's second instruction, as we see in the verse, it says, pray with all prayer and petition, and then pray at all times. All kinds of prayers, and the second one is at all times, and we can say this, number two, pray constant prayers. That's your insert there. Pray constant prayers, not occasional prayers. You might... Say, Pastor, I understand what it's like to get up in the morning and have a ton of prayer and then go off into my day, but you're telling me that I'm supposed to just keep praying all day long? How do I do that? Well, I heard an illustration recently. It makes sense to me. You know, you're on your phone. You're talking to somebody. Then someone hands you a responsibility to do, or maybe you need to do the dishes or work on your car or even drive your car. You put it on speakerphone, and then you just keep doing what you're doing. You keep talking with the person. That's what God is saying. In the time of battle. He's saying, don't stop talking to me. Don't put our conversation on pause. Don't let it be an occasional thing that you are doing now and then. You need my great strength. Don't stop talking to me. That's what God is saying. Just keep that on, on speakerphone and talk to me. And talk to me, again, combined with the first one, about things that are going well. Talk to me about your worship and adoration to me. Talk to me about your requests. Talk to me about any sins that have come along. That's how you battle pray. All kinds, and then you don't stop. You just keep doing it. That means as you're facing the pressure to fix your leaky ceiling, you're talking to God about it all the way through. As you're facing pressure to worry, you're talking to God about it. As you're facing pressure to outburst in anger or uh, to doubt your salvation or to lie to someone and you don't want to do these things and you're, you're wavering, talk to God, talk to God, talk to God. That's what God says. You need my special strength in that day of evil. Keep talking to me. Keep the lines open. What if Eve had prayed like this? You know... God, this serpent is telling me that you're wrong and I won't die if I eat of the fruit on the tree. Would she have been more likely to resist that temptation? I think so. She had practiced praying. What about Judas when he was tempted to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? If he had said, Father, I'm really tempted by this. That money is very, very desirous to me. But would that have kept him from doing that? We don't know. But certainly it can help us in the, in the day of evil to continually be talking to God about it. You know, every once in a while, uh, we hear someone who's leading a public prayer, and they'll start off by saying, Lord, we come into your presence right now to be able to talk to you about this. And you want to say, well, wait a minute. When are we not in God's presence? 
We're constantly in God's presence. We never come into his presence if we're his people. We're constantly filled. You know, he lives inside us. We live in him. So God says, since you are constantly in my presence, constantly be talking to me. But all the more important in the evil day, when you need my strength, you need my wisdom, you need my help, talk to me, adore me, thank me, confess to me, request of me to supply your needs. Don't stop talking. How would you grade yourself in that? When things get bad for you, are you constantly talking to God with all kinds of type of prayer? This has been a, a very helpful sermon for me personally to be able to understand more. And this is, again, all about having the evil day and how to fight well in it through our battle prayers. So, God's third instruction. We find in this phrase, again, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times, and then it ends it in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. If I asked you to come up here and speak to all of us this morning about what it means to pray in the Spirit, what would you say? If you're not quite sure what that means, you're not alone. I looked up about a dozen different commentaries this week, and (laughs) very few of them even addressed it, and then it was like, "Uh, we're not quite sure what that means. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Well, I decided to do my own study on it. So... Uh, One of the principles for interpreting the Bible, for understanding a Bible verse that you don't really know what it means, is to compare the Bible with the Bible. So you take a passage, maybe it's a passage on worry, you look up up the other passages on worry and see what they say. Compare the Bible with the Bible, and that oftentimes helps you to understand that unclear passage. So what I decided to do is look up every reference that said in the Spirit in the Bible. And I found 13 of them. And I found a couple that does help shed light on understanding what it means to pray in the Spirit. Um, Some, I found in researching this, turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 14, and that says this. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. This passage is teaching that those who have the gift of tongues can actually not just speak in tongues, they can pray to God in tongues. And some people have come away with this and said, okay, this is what it means to pray in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit means praying in tongues. And yet you, know, you need to defeat demons, yes? You've got to pray in tongues to be able to defeat demons. That's what praying in the Spirit means. The problem with this interpretation is that the phrase in the Spirit isn't used in this verse. The person who's speaking in tongues says, I pray in my Spirit. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't even mentioned in this verse. Uh, So praying in tongues is not linked with praying in the Spirit in Scripture. And yet, if you Google it, you'll find many pastors, many churches, many theologians saying, no, this is exactly what praying in the Spirit means. Praying in the Spirit means praying in tongues. And you need to pray in tongues if you're going to defeat demons. You also need to pray in tongues if you're going to have God's power in your life. If you don't pray in tongues, you won't have God's power. They'll say... Some say you you can't even know if you're saved unless you speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you can't even know if you're a Christian or not. What does the Bible say about this? It's troubled the faith of a lot of people who don't have the gift of tongues, who've never spoken in tongues, and they listen to this. It's, It's really troubled their faith. Can I comfort you right now and say very clearly, the Bible never commands Christians to speak in tongues. Nowhere in Paul's... Epistles and writing to the Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Colossians, none of them does he ever say, you must speak in tongues. There will be lots of people in life who will insist, you've got to speak in tongues to defeat demons, have the power, no salvation. The truth is God never insists on it. God never commands it. There are many examples of people speaking in tongues in the Bible, absolutely. But there's never a command for Christians to speak in tongues. So let that comfort you. Uh, What I found out through my study is that in the Spirit does not mean speaking in tongues. So what does it mean? What does praying in the Spirit mean? Well, there are two other verses that I found that were helpful in understanding what praying in the Spirit means. One is in Revelation 1.10 where it says, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John uses that phrase there. And then one other helpful one is in Ephesians 3.5 where it says, God's plan has now been revealed to his apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Both these verses use this, and they can help us understand what praying in the Spirit means. Number one, 
John says that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What, what was he doing? What was going on there? Well, the context suggests that he was worshiping God. He was worshiping God. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day, worshiping God. And I think we can understand that. Uh, when we come, like on a Sunday morning, to worship God, we draw ourselves close to God in order to speak to him. We, we, we draw near to him uh, in order to, you know, give praise and, and, and ourselves to him. Uh, that's, uh, it's kind of like uh, there is a circle, and we are out here, and the circle is the spirit of God, and we step into that circle to draw near to God in a special way in worship. The opposite would be a circle that is uh, uh, the flesh. You and I all know how to live in the flesh and react in selfish ways and in ways that are not godly. And sometimes we can step into that circle and act that way, or we can step into the circle of the Spirit and have and produce love and joy and peace and patience and the fruit of the Spirit. So if that's the way to look at, at it, John was saying, I stepped into the circle of the Spirit on the Lord's day and drew close to God and... Let him lead me in, in, in worship on that day, stepping into the circle of the Spirit. Now, when we look at the other passage, Ephesians 3, it says that God's plan was revealed to his apostles and prophets when they were in the Spirit. Okay, so they were not in the flesh. They were not in the flesh circle. They were thinking about themselves, prioritizing themselves, letting the flesh lead their life. They were in the circle of, in, of letting the Spirit lead their lives, and when they were there, God revealed to them his great plan, and then they communicated that to the world. So if that's the right understanding of what it means to be in the spirit, spirit, it seems like these verses are saying that being in the Spirit means stepping into God's circle and letting him lead our lives. What, what a, uh, Galatians talks about in you know, walking in the Spirit, Walking alongside the Spirit, letting him lead you, guide you, control your choices in life. John was doing that in worship on a Sunday. The apostles and prophets were doing that when received God's uh, inspiration to write the Bible. And in our passage, it means when you go to prayer, you step into the circle of the Holy Spirit and you allow him to lead and generate and guide your prayers. Praying in the Spirit means letting the leadership of the Spirit have its way as you pray. And that's what I'm putting there as the third instruction for battle praying in your insert. Pray by the Spirit's leading, not your own. You're praying in the Spirit. You're not praying on your own. You're praying with the Spirit's leading in your life. Now, very often in life, we don't know what to pray for, but especially when we're in an evil day, something that's disastrous has happened, we're really being pressured to give in to sin, we don't know what to pray for. So what do we do? We ask God. The, the roof is leaking. What's the first thing I do? Uh, I don't know who to contact. Why do I start in, on my roof? If I don't? And you go to God and you say, okay, you lead this. You guide me with wisdom to make the best, best choices. You are struggling with worry. You're struggling with lust. You're struggling with doubting your salvation. You go to God and you ask him to lead you in knowing what to pray for. Remember, God always knows the right thing to pray for. What you don't want to do is pray in the flesh. James tells us what happens when we pray in the flesh. It says in James 4.3, You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. This is definitely praying the wrong way, and it's going to get the wrong results when we put ourselves first and don't consider what God wants us to pray for. Praying in the Spirit means you're praying, letting the Spirit lead you what to pray for. Well, how do we know what the Spirit wants us to pray for? Well, there are two ways. Number one, you look in his book. God, the Holy Spirit, inspired the scriptures, and they give us lots of instructions on how to pray. Make sure we're praying according to the way the Bible tells us to pray. It's praying in the Spirit. One of the most helpful passages is what we call the Lord's Prayer, which really isn't the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that he gave for us to follow. And there's the Lord's Prayer. And if we note especially the order, this is very helpful on how we should pray. There's six requests here. The first three have to do with praying for God's welfare, praying for his fame, his name, his kingdom, and then praying for his will to be done. The first three requests are pray for God. Second three requests is prayer for us, 
Pray for our provision, our forgiveness, our protection from evil. God wants us praying for all these things, but that order is very important there. It means that if we are going to be led by the Spirit in how to pray, our highest concern in prayer is to be for God first, and then us. We do matter, but we matter after God. Remember, this is exactly what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had requests that he prayed, but he said, look, my highest concern is your will be done. That's praying in the Spirit. So when we go to pray, like for the leaky roof, we say, okay, Lord, I'm panicking here. I'm not quite sure where to start. Uh, Who do I contact? How do I address this? But you know what? My highest concern is for your glory through this. Let me shine a bright light on you through this. Let your kingdom grow because of this. Let your will be done through what goes on here. That's my highest concern. That's praying in the Spirit. How do we know what praying in the Spirit is? We follow the instructions that the Spirit has given us in the Scriptures on how to pray. And there's many more outside the Lord's Prayer. There are other ways uh, to know. There's one other particular way to know how to pray in the Spirit. One is follow the Scriptures. The other is follow the promptings that the Spirit lays on your heart. You ever had a strong urge that you needed to pray for somebody? Praying in the Spirit is saying yes to that instead of dismissing it. I shared with the church a while back when Carlene was working at Boscov's. It was a Christmas season. She had been working until like 1 in the morning, was driving home like about 1.15, 1.30. And I was sleeping on the couch waiting for her to come home. And I had a dream that she hit a deer with her car and was killed. And it jolted me awake and I sat there and I thought, She's driving home right now. I'm going to pray hard. So I started praying for her that she'd be safe on the the road. A few minutes later, she called me, and she was crying. She said that she'd been driving down 522, doing about 55 miles an hour, came over a, a rise, and there were five deer in the center of the road, right there. And she hit the largest one. And that deer flew up in the air, and imagine if just about 55 miles an hour, how easily that could have gone through the windshield. She said it didn't go over the windshield. It just went straight up and then came down on her hood and then flew off to the side. And she was safe. I know God woke me up to pray for her. There's no doubt in my mind. That was the Spirit saying, I want you to pray now. And he woke me up to pray. I believe it saved her life. That's another way of praying in the Spirit. When the Spirit lays upon your heart, pray for this person now. Don't Quench that. Throw a bucket of water on that fire. Make sure you say yes and pray in the Spirit. You may not ever see a result. It may not necessarily. It could have been just your imagination. You don't know, though. It could very well be the Spirit of God. Just pray. You lose nothing by praying. And if it is the prompting of the Holy Spirit, then you've done something that could really be useful. That's the second way that we can pray in the Spirit. First of all, by Scriptures. What they teach us, that's praying in the Spirit. But also the promptings on your heart for the things that God would have you to do, saying yes to that. How would you grade yourself in this area of praying in the Spirit by following his lead and how he's instructed us through the Scriptures or instructed you through the own promptings on your heart? Are you saying yes to that? God says, I'm teaching you how to battle pray here. It involves letting me lead you on what to pray for. The last half of the verse that we have in verse 18 talks about the fact that we need to not only battle pray for ourselves, we need to battle pray for all of us. Look at verse 18 one more time. It says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and then look, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition, and what are the the next words? For all the saints. God is saying this battle praying is is to be a church-wide work. Not just for ourselves. Do you know someone today who is going through an evil day? Maybe a a real disaster like Job has come upon them. Or maybe you know that they're really struggling with heavy temptation. To doubt God, to give in to sin, to wander away, whatever it might be. Do you know someone like that? God's saying, battle pray for them. 
Number one, pray all kinds of prayers for them. Number two, pray all the time for them, not just sporadically. Pray, 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 pray for them. This is the time of need. Pray, pray, pray for them. And then let me lead your prayers. Look to scriptures for the way I instruct you to pray and then listen to the promptings of my spirit upon your heart and how to pray for that person. We need to battle pray for one another. Is there another Christian you know right now that needs your prayers like that? Do that for them. Very clear command here. With all perseverance, that means don't stop. When you get discouraged and when you get tired, pray anyway. Pray for that person. Or maybe you're here today and you do need to pray for yourself. You're the one that's in the evil day right now. And I don't know what's going on in your life. But maybe you've got some really bad news recently. Maybe you've had a pressure to give in to something that you know God doesn't want you to do, but the pressure's really on you. God's telling you how to fight. Fight with the first six forms of his strength, but really, the seventh form, battle pray hard now. Pray all types of prayers. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, requests for supplying your needs. Number two, continually do it, not occasionally. Pray, pray, pray as often as you can think about it. Pray, pray, pray. Keep hammering, hammering, hammering back against the pressure that's hammering on you. Remember what the disciples didn't do. They didn't pray, and so they didn't defeat that demon. Don't be guilty of that. Your homework is to go home and pray. Pray for Christians you know who are in an evil day, or pray for yourself if you're in that evil day right now. God has given us these verses because he wants you to stand firm in the evil day. But it doesn't happen automatically. It only happens as you work hard. Work hard at defeating demons. Your life will only grow stronger when you do. Don't give up. Keep persevering. Fight hard against the demons who come against us. And you will defeat them in the end.